Uh, I'm from Melbourne. Uh, if you're in Melbourne, come along to BitDevs. We uh, go through technical topics once a month. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We're getting some hands-on stuff as well. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about uh, multi-sig as it works today and how it's going to improve in the very near future. Um, just a show of hands, who, if you don't have to put your hand up if you don't want to dox your, your setup, who's tried multi-sig before? A few of you. Who found it a little bit scary or a little bit worrying? Yeah, pretty much the same, same set of hands. All right, so first I'm going to tell you about yeah, problems with existing multi-sig, and then we're going to get into uh, the future of Taproot multi-sig. Let's get into it. So what is a, what is a Bitcoin multi-sig? So a Bitcoin multi-sig is a way that to lock Bitcoin behind multiple keys, and it requires some threshold of keys in order to spend that Bitcoin. So for example, you could have a two of two, where you have two keys and you require to sign with both keys in order to spend your funds. Or you could have, say, a two of three, where you have three keys and you need any two of those three in order to spend your Bitcoin. Now this is really good for uh, backup redundancy. You could lose one of those keys and you've still got two left. You can still spend your Bitcoin. Uh, or you could, yeah, you could, one of those keys could get hacked and it actually doesn't give them access to your money. You can also do more crazy things like a six out of 10 or a five of eight, or really whatever uh, suits your setup. So when do we use multi-sigs? There's, there's two main times that we use multi-sigs. One of those is for individuals. So if you're self-custodying your Bitcoin, um, you might want to distribute that risk across multiple devices. So instead of keeping all of your Bitcoin on, say, one hardware wallet or one air-gapped laptop, you can instead distribute that risk across multiple devices. So if one of those devices were to get stolen or you lose one of your uh, hardware wallets, you can still access your Bitcoin. The other scenario that's quite common is companies or groups. So you can distribute the same risk uh, across a number of individuals or parties. So instead of one individual at a company custodying that Bitcoin, you can distribute it across a number of people. So for example, if you're running a Bitcoin exchange, you don't want to give the CEO complete control of uh, the Bitcoin. It could be a lot of money. Uh, so you could give, say, three keys. If you have three executives, you could give them each a key and, say, require two of them to sign for withdrawals. Um, so in this example, we've got Sam, Arthur, and Ben. They each have a key on a two of three. And let's say Sam doesn't sign, but Arthur and Ben sign. They have some Bitcoin signature. That's not what they look like. And they can unlock their multi-sig and spend some Bitcoin. So multi-sigs at the moment in Bitcoin use what's called a script multi-sig. A Bitcoin script is like a set of uh, codified conditions that have to be satisfied in, in, in order to spend a UTXO, so an unspent transaction output. So a script might look like this. This is what a multi-sig script looks like. And actually, script multi-sigs are more like uh, three individual uh, key pairs. Uh, so you have public keys on the right and private keys on the left. And to spend from this script, it requires two of those keys to sign out of the three. So you can actually think of a script multi-sig more like n individual locks with some requirement to spend, to sign under t of them uh, in order to unlock that Bitcoin. So you can think of script multi-sigs like n smaller locks. It's going to be important in a second. Script multi-sigs have really, really big footprints. If anyone's looked on mempool.space, it is glaringly obvious what is a multi-sig and what is not a multi-sig. So you can see this yellow label down here. This is a two of three. And everyone can see that that's a two of three on chain. It's really, really easy to track on chain entities that are using a multi-sig, a script multi-sig. Um, combined with other information, this can leak like crazy insights into even which individuals or devices are being used to sign. There's a really famous, uh, well, I think it's, it's famous to me, I really like it. There's an article called Analyzing the Fallout of the BitMEX Lawsuits. Um, one of the exchange uh, executives got arrested, um, I think 2019 or something. Or, no, it must have been later than that. But he got arrested and they were able to determine using some on-chain analysis 
which keys were held by which executives. So when they saw that one of the executives stopped signing, they could tell that was the one that got arrested and they could figure out which executives held the other keys, which is pretty scary if you're running you know, a, an operation worth billions of dollars. Script Multisig also has really, or well, I think are really bad foot guns. Um, and, and they're not obvious like up front. So even if you have uh, enough keys to spend for enough private keys to spend from a multisig, you actually need to know the public keys as well of the multisig. So you can't lose the locks, the public locks either. You need to know a threshold t number of secrets, but you also need to know n every single lock, uh, which doesn't sound like obvious to me. Um, and the, the reason for that is you need to be able to recreate a redeem script in order to spend the Bitcoin. And, and in order to do that, you need to know uh, all the public keys. So you, yeah, you need to know all the public keys, otherwise you're screwed. Script multisigs are also very static. So if you lose a key, you're not able to add a new one in. You can't replace it. If you want to add a new key, you're going to have to sw sweep your whole multisig and make a whole new one. Um, so you cannot add, remove, or replace keys. And you can also not change the security threshold. So these are some pretty bad uh, user experience pain points for script multisig. So can we make multi-signatures easier? And can we avoid the footprints and foot guns of script multisig as we do so? This is Frost. So Frost is the next generation of Taproot multisigs. So not script, it doesn't use Bitcoin script, it uses Taproot and cryptography in order to achieve this multi-signature security. So Frost, I'll, I'll go through what these big words mean just quickly. So flexible, round, optimized, Schnorr threshold signatures. A threshold signature scheme is uh, participants choose a T out of N, just like the script multisigs, you choose how many uh, keys there are gonna be and what threshold of keys you need in order to spend from that multisig, same as script multisig. The threshold nature of Frost comes from mathematics and cryptography as opposed to programs and conditions written into Bitcoin code. Frost uses Schnorr signatures, which were added to Bitcoin in the Taproot upgrade. They look like uh, BC1P, P2, they're called P2 pay to Taproot addresses. And the really cool, really, really important thing, the takeaway from Frost, if you're gonna take anything away from this, uh, I would say that Frost uses a single Schnorr public key to re represent the entire multisig. So if you remember just back before when I was talking about script multisigs, there's actually sort of N public keys inside the script as opposed to just one public key protecting the multisig. Frost is also round optimized. Uh, this is just important, so it means you have very little communication overhead. So if anyone's ever done like air gap signing on a hardware device, you only have to take the SD card to your hardware wallet once and then take it back to your computer. There are existing uh, threshold signature schemes that have been built in the past that take a lot of rounds. So you might need to ferry an SD card around like five times, which would just suck for user experience. So it's very nice with Frost that we have it fast and reliable signing uh, with little network overhead. So just to break down Frost a little bit more, maybe make it a bit more familiar, you can kind of think of it like breaking up a key, but, it, but it's almost not like breaking up a key. It's more like we create a key together. We, each device creates a fragment of a key, and these fragments are sort of interchangeable in, in this multisig. So on the right, we have a three out of five, and we need any three of those keys in order to sign. So creating the multisig is called key generation. And multiple parties or multiple devices can interact to create a single joint public key with the threshold they choose. In order to sign with Frost, you take a threshold number of parties and they each sign with their individual fragment. So we take, let's take three parties, party three, party one, party five and they each sign with their, their secret share. And then with Frost, we're actually able to add these secret shares together in a special way 
that forms a complete signature at the end. So the really cool thing about Frost is it's a single public key, single signature. And that has some really cool flow and effects. So self-custody evolved with Frost. A direct flow and benefit from having a single public key and single signature is that these transactions coming from a Frost multi-signature are much, much more private. If you look on mempool.space at a, a Frost multi-signature, no one, you will have no idea uh, that it's a Frost multi-signature. You'll not be able to tell. Mempool.space will not say it's a two or three or a four or five or whatever. Uh, you won't be able to tell. No one will be able to tell. Um, so Frost transactions out of a Frost multi-sig look like any other taproot transaction on chain, which is really, really cool. And this also means you have smaller transaction fees as a nice benefit. Frost makes for a much more uh, simpler user experience. So single public key, single XPUB to derive addresses from. There's no need to store. You only need to store a single XPUB and the individual key shares, the secret shares. And so actually something I, I realized the other day is that any wallet that supports watch only uh, taproot addresses you'll just be able to put in a Frost uh, extended public key and it, you'll be able to watch that wallet without it actually being a Frost wallet. You won't be able to sign with it, but because it's taproot and it uses a single XPUB, you'll actually be able to uh, do a, a sort of watch-only cold wallet very easily with Frost, which is kind of cool. Another nice thing about Frost is you actually, we, we believe this to be true, we haven't, we haven't proved the security yet, but you can replace keys. So you could add or remove keys from the multi-sig. And in order to do this, you need some threshold level of agreeance. So if you have tea parties who are willing to, say, kick out one of the other guys, they can do so. And the reason this is OK is because if you have tea parties who want to do this, they could steal the money anyway. So it's OK if they can uh, change the multi-sig around. As with the threshold, so you can change the threshold, which is another cool thing about Frost. A really good example of when this would come in handy is if you're like a company and you've got, say, the, the exchange example just before, you've got some executives and say one of them wants to leave the company. What do you do? You don't want to sweep the whole wallet and move it into a whole new wallet with a new key for the new executive. Instead, you could just invalidate the executive's key that's leaving and add a new one in. Frost signing devices. This is something I'm really excited about. So. We could make uh, hardware wallets, much like the ones you're, you're used to today, like your cold cards or your ledgers. Um, and an idea that actually Lloyd had was that we could connect these devices into a chain. And so we can connect, uh, say, two devices into one another and then connect the end device into a laptop coordinator. And then from the laptop, or it could be a mobile phone, we can tell the devices, let's create a frost key. And on each device, we can check that each device has the same view of the key generation. And we can click and verify on each device that, yep, everything looks good. Let's create this Frost key. After key gen, uh, you can sign on these devices one at a time. You could plug, plug one into the laptop and, and sign a transaction. Or you could even plug T of them, connect T of them into each other again, the threshold number, and sign all at once if you wanted to. Uh, the cool thing about being able to separate them and sign one at a time means that you can do, say, your geographical uh, distribution of keys. You could you know, leave one at your house, leave one with your lawyer, leave one in a uh, vault or something, leave one with your parents, um, whatever you want to do with your setup. And that way you can. Uh, you don't have to bring all the keys together, which is sort of a bit of security risk. Frost also has a really cool uh, ability to do private collaborative custody. So if anyone's ever heard of Unchained Capital or Casa, they provide this service, this multi-sig service, where you can give them one of your, your keys to your multi-sig and say, if you were to ever lose one of those keys, you can reach out to Casa and be like, hey, I've lost my key. I need your help. Can you please sign this transaction for me? And they usually do that for a fee or a subscription service. The really cool thing about Frost is that you could give one of these companies a key, but they don't actually need to know uh, what your extended public key is. Um, so at the moment, Casa and Unchained, they can track everything you do on chain. But with Frost, you could give them a secret share 
they can sign things. They might know what your uh, individual things you're signing, but they don't get this view of all your transactions. And they only sign things uh, like when you really need them to. So that's it's really cool privacy. Frost, because Frost has this single signature, single public key on chain, it's really private. It really improves uh, the privacy of con things like contracts and federations built on top of Bitcoin. So for example, things like Fedi Mint, Federated Mints. Uh, if you want to deposit Bitcoin to a federation, which a federation essentially controls a multi-sig, if you want to deposit uh, money into this federation, these peg-ins and peg-outs can be highly private, which I think will be very important for things like Fedi Mint. Lightning networks uh, channels are essentially two of twos. So uh, Frost is a step towards making more private lightning channels, although there are some other things that need to be done there. And there are also some interesting ideas about sharing lightning channels across more than two people, uh, which maybe you could do with Frost. So just quickly, I'll, I'm going to go through this one pretty fast. Adding on to Frost, if anyone's heard of Roast, Roast is a, like a way of running Frost, uh, a set of instructions for how to run Frost. An example of when you might like want to do this is if you have this exchange set up where three executives have a key each. Say one of the executives like doesn't actually want these withdrawals to go through. What they could do is pretend, yeah, I'll sign, I'll sign these withdrawals, but when it comes around for their turn to sign, they might just say, I'm actually not going to sign it. So malicious parties with Frost can sort of delay the signing process. You have to go around with different combinations of, of keys until you find uh, T parties who are willing to sign. Roast is a set of instructions for how to run Frost. It is a wrapper uh, that guarantees if you have T honest parties, you'll eventually arrive at a valid signature. With Frost, you can also embed tap scripts along your Frost multisig. So you can have a more traditional Bitcoin script alongside your Frost multisig. Um, and a, a cool idea, another cool idea from Lloyd is that you can have a, uh, a, a tap script multisig hidden underneath your Frost multisig. And this tap script multisig is only ever revealed if you were to spend through that spending path. Um, so you can have this sort of uh, separate backup for your Frost multisig, which is a more traditional script multisig. Some other Frost fun, just quickly. Uh, this is something I hacked together. If you've heard of Nostar, Nostar uses Schnorr signatures. So we can do any crazy fun stuff you can do on uh, with Taproot on Bitcoin. You can also kind of do this weird application to Nostar. So Frost plus Nostar is Froster. And it is, I think, I think it's the world's first collaborative social media uh, account. So you can have, you could share a social media account between your mates. You know, each one of them has a key. And if you want to post something, you've got to ask your mates, please sign this. Let's, uh, let's make this post. Um, one really cool use case for this is to protect against what I call rogue intern attacks. So if you give the, uh, the intern, you know, the keys to your social media account, you don't want to have them have like free reign to post whatever the hell they want. So it's pretty nice that you can have this uh, sort of collaborative custody for social media. Froster, ooh. Froster is probably what DAOs should have been. So if you've heard of Ethereum DAOs, really what a DAO really should be is just a T of N key pair that just votes and signs things. The same key pair can protect a DAO treasury. The DAO can vote and pass motions which control the behavior of the DAO and change, say, the keys. Federations should use secure threshold cryptography for their social presence. So there's things like FediMint, might want to have a, a shared Nostra account that each federation guardian is a member of, so that not just one federation is saying, oh yeah, we're doing updates, or oh yeah, down, click on this sketchy link or something. Instead, everyone in the federation, or some threshold number in the federation has to sign off on posts for them to go through. So thanks very much for listening. Thanks for coming to Bitcoin Alive. Thanks to Lloyd and Adam, who have been working closely with on Frost. And thanks very much to the Bitcoin Alive team. Uh, it's been great. We have really exciting, powerful self-custody tech on the way. So if you want to follow along, you can follow me on Twitter. We don't have a, a, a site going yet, but there'll be one soon. So keep an eye out. A Frost implementation and Froster. I've actually made a Froster Windows binary. So you can run uh, Froster on a Windows laptop if you, if you want to give it a try. Uh, so thanks for listening. Any questions, we might have a minute or so.